All right, everyone, get ready. Because today, we're taking a deep dive into the world of intercorporate investments. Yeah. These investments are a big deal. Yeah. Especially if you're prepping for the CFA Level 2 exam. For sure. And it's not just about the exam, right? I mean, it's fascinating to see how companies use these investments in the real world. Absolutely. We're talking about companies making strategic moves yeah. to gain influence, take control, and basically shape their financial future by investing in other companies. It's like they're playing a high stakes game of chess. Right, yeah. Exactly. With each move impacting their balance sheet, income statement, and even their overall valuation. And that's what we're going to break down today. The different types of intercorporate investments, yeah. the accounting methods for each. Uh, and we'll even explore those more complex structures like special purpose entities. All right. So let's start with the basics. Why do companies even make these investments in the first place? Well, there are a bunch of reasons, right? Yeah. Diversifying their assets, getting a foot in the door of a new market, mm. or maybe even snapping up some cutting edge tech or talent. Right. So they have their reasons. Yeah. But how do we actually analyze these investments? That's where the level of influence comes in. Okay. What do you mean? The level of influence or control the investing company has over the company they're putting money into. Ah, so that's the key factor. It is. Got it. And it leads us to four main categories. We've got investments in financial assets, Go. investments in associates, joint ventures, and business combinations. All right. Let's break those down one by one, starting with investments in financial assets. Sounds good. Now, this category is probably the most familiar to anyone who's ever you know, bought a stock. Right. It's basically companies buying stocks, bonds, or other financial instruments. The main goal here is generating a financial return, pure and simple. Okay, so it's all about the money. Pretty much. But what about control? In this case, there's no significant influence over the company they're investing in. They're just looking for a return. Now, the accounting standard that governs these investments is IFRS 9, right? That's right. Didn't that replace the old ISO 39? It did. And it brought with it some significant changes, didn't it? It definitely did. So for our CFA candidates out there, pay attention. Yeah. IFRS 9 really emphasizes aligning the accounting treatment with what the company intends to do with that asset. Yeah, it's not a one-size-fits-all approach anymore. So what are the key factors under IFRS 9? Two main things. Okay. The contractual cash flow characteristics of the asset. Hmm. and the company's business model for managing it. So it's not enough to just know if it's a stock or a bond. Exactly. We have to know what the company plans to do with it. Right. Hold it long term, trade it for a quick profit. Mm -hmm. All of that matters. It all factors into how we classify and measure the investment under IFRS 9. Okay, so that leads to the three main measurement categories, right? Yep. Amortized cost, yeah. fair value through profit or loss which yeah. we call FVPL, and fair value through other comprehensive income, or FVOCI. Right, so choosing the right category depends on those two factors we discussed. Right. Cash flow characteristics and the business model. Let's take an example. Right. If a company is holding a bond until it matures, just collecting those interest payments, they likely use amortized cost. That makes sense. But what if they have a bunch of stocks they actively trade for short-term gains? Then they'd probably classify those stocks as FVPL. FVPL. And what does that mean exactly? They'd be marked to market each reporting period, and any changes in fair value would go straight to the income statement. Ah, so that's where the real-world impact comes in. Exactly. FVPL could make the company's earnings more volatile, while amortized costs keeps things smoother and more predictable. That's the trade-off. Interesting. And for those investments that are kind of in between... Yeah. Held for c collecting those cash flows, but also potentially for sale. That's where FVOCI might be the right fit. FVOCI, what does that do? Well, with FVOCI, those unrealized gains and losses are recognized in other comprehensive income. Okay. They stay off the income statement until the asset is actually sold. So IFRS 9 really tries to match the accounting treatment to the economic reality of the investment. That's the big takeaway here. And for analysts, it means we have to dig into those footnotes. Yep. We need to understand the company's intentions and strategy to really assess the impact of these investments. Couldn't have said it better myself. Now let's move on to a category that adds a whole new level of complexity. Investments in associates. Ah, yes. Investments in associates. This is where we start talking about significant influence. 
but not necessarily full control. Right. It's like being a powerful board member. Exactly. You can influence decisions, but you don't have the final say. And usually this means owning somewhere between 20% and 50%. Of the voting shares. Exactly. But how do we know if that ownership actually translates into real influence over the company's operations and financial policies? That's the million dollar question, isn't it? It is. Simply owning 20% doesn't automatically mean you've got significant influence. So what do we look for? We look for evidence. Evidence. Yeah, evidence of that influence. Okay, give me an example. Well, things like representation on the board, mm -hmm. being involved in key decisions. Got it. Or even having contracts that give the investor certain rights. So it's not a black and white rule. No. Nope. It's more of a judgment call based on the specific situation. That's right. But once we've established that significant influence is there, we use the equity method, right? That's the method we use. Can you tell us a little bit more about how that works? Sure. The equity method is sometimes called one-line consolidation. One-line consolidation. Why is it called that? Because it boils down to showing the investor's share of the other company's net assets and net income right on the investor's own balance sheet and income statement. Okay. <laughs> so instead of all the individual assets and liabilities, we just have one line. One lot. Representing their share. Okay. So it's like creating a mini version of the other company's financials. You got it. Right on the investor's books. Yeah. Can you give us a real world example? Sure. Imagine company A buys a 30% stake in company B for $30 million. Okay. Initially, company A would just record that investment on their balance sheet at cost. So $30 million. Mm -hmm. Then as company B makes profits or takes losses, Company A adjusts the value of their investment and shows their share of those profits or losses on their own income statement. Okay, let's say Company B makes a profit of $10 million. All right, so in that case, Company A would increase their investment by $3 million. Which is 30% of $10 million. Exactly. Yeah. And they would record $3 million in equity income on their income statement. So it's not a static thing. The value and the income fluctuate with the performance of the company they've invested in. Precisely. But I'm guessing this method also comes with some analytical challenges, right? Of course. Like what? Well, one of the biggest ones is figuring out if the equity method is even the right one to use in the first place. Okay. How do we do that? We have to make sure that significant influence actually exists. Right. Just because a company owns 20%, it doesn't guarantee they have real influence. Exactly. And on the flip side, yeah. a company might have significant influence with less than 20%. Oh. through things like contracts or other arrangements. So analysts, be skeptical. Don't just blindly apply the equity method based on ownership percentage alone. You got it. Now, what about the information on the investor's financial statements? Does the equity method give us the whole picture? Not necessarily. What do you mean? Remember, we're only seeing the investor's share of the net assets and net income. Okay. We don't actually yeah. see the individual assets and liabilities of the other company, which could be important. Right, for understanding the investor's risk. Exactly. And what about the reported income? Yeah, is that reliable? The equity income shows the investor's share of the profit. But that doesn't mean that cash is just sitting there waiting for the investor. So the equity income might not reflect the actual cash flow from the investment. That's right. The other company might be reinvesting their earnings, right. or there might be restrictions on dividend payments. So we can't just stop at the reported equity income. Nope. We have to look at the other company's financial statements mm. and dividend policy exactly. to really understand what's happening with the cash flow. You're getting it. So analyzing these investments is more complicated than just looking at one line on the investor's financials. It is. We need to understand the relationship, the level of influence, and what's going on with the other company's performance and cash flow. You got it. Now, what happens when a company wants to go beyond just influencing another company? What if they want full control? That's where we get into business combinations. Business combinations. So we're talking about mergers and acquisitions. Mergers, acquisitions, consolidations, the whole shebang. Where the investor becomes the acquirer and takes control. Turning the other company into a subsidiary. Uh, I see. And this brings a whole new set of accounting rules and analytical challenges. So how do we define controlling interest? Mm. Is it always just owning more than 50% of the voting shares? In most cases, yes. Yeah. Owning more than 50% is enough. Okay. But control can happen in other ways too. Really? Yeah, like through contracts Challenge. that give the investor the right to appoint most of the board members or have a big say in key decisions. So it's about having the power. The power to make the decisions. Even if you don't technically own most of the shares. Precisely. Now, when it comes to accounting for these business combinations, 
We use the acquisition method, right? That's right. This is where we move beyond the equity method. We do. The acquisition method replaced the old pooling of interests method, mm -hmm. and it gives us a much clearer picture of the combined company's financial position. So the acquisition method basically combines the two companies and shows them as one entity. But I'm guessing there are a lot of calculations and adjustments involved. You're absolutely right. To make sure we're reflecting everything accurately. The acquisition method tackles three main things. First, recognizing and measuring the assets and liabilities of the combined company. Okay. Second, recognizing and accounting for goodwill. Mm -hmm. And third, accounting for any non-controlling interest if the acquirer doesn't buy the whole company. Okay, there's a lot to unpack there. There is. Let's start with the assets and liabilities. What's the main principle here? Do we just carry over the book values from each company? Not quite. What do we do then? The key is fair value. Fair value. We need to look at all the identifiable assets and liabilities of the acquired company. Okay. And we no. remeasure them at their fair values. Ah, so we're not just taking the historical book values. Yep. We're trying to show what those assets and liabilities are actually worth in the current market. Precisely. That makes sense because the book values might not reflect the true value or the potential of the combined companies. Exactly. For example, let's say company A buys company B and company B owns a factory that's on their books for $50 million. Okay. But an appraisal says the factory is actually worth $70 million. Because of its location or upgrades? Right. So in the consolidated financial statements, that factory would be recorded at $70 million. Got it. So we adjust the assets to their real worth. And what about liabilities? Are those treated the same way? Absolutely. So if company B had a debt of $30 million, but because of interest rate changes, it's now actually worth $28 million. Then it would be recorded at $28 million. All right, so both the assets and liabilities are adjusted to their fair values. But I'm sure there are some tricky situations that can come up. You bet. Things can get complicated when we're dealing with contingent liabilities. Contingent liabilities. Yeah, those potential obligations that depend on things happening in the future. Right, like lawsuits or environmental cleanup costs. How do we handle those under the acquisition method? It all depends on whether we can reliably measure their fair value. So if we can put a reasonably accurate number on it, exactly. then we recognize it on the balance sheet. That's right. But if not, we have to disclose it in the footnotes and think about how it could potentially impact the company's financials. So even those uncertain future obligations need to be considered. They do. Now, what about indemnification assets? Ah, Indemnification assets are interesting. They sound like some kind of protection. They are. It's basically when the seller agrees to compensate the buyer for certain losses okay. that are related to the assets or liabilities they acquired. So like an insurance policy built into the acquisition deal. Exactly. And these indemnification assets are also recognized at their fair value. Interesting. Okay. So we've covered how to recognize and measure assets and liabilities. Including those tricky contingent items and indemnification assets. Right. But now I really want to talk about goodwill. Goodwill. It's a concept that seems to play a big role in business combinations. It does. Goodwill is a fascinating and often debated concept in accounting. So if we've already adjusted all the assets and liabilities to their fair values, what's left to justify paying a premium for a company? Goodwill represents that premium, okay. the amount the acquirer pays above and beyond the fair value of the identifiable net assets. So it's the value of those intangible things that make a company successful, exactly. but that we can't easily measure, like brand reputation, customer relationships, a skilled workforce, or a strong management team. You got it. Those hard to measure, but incredibly valuable advantages. But how do we actually measure goodwill? It seems very subjective. It can be, but we have a method. We calculate goodwill as the difference between the total amount paid for the acquisition and the fair value of the identifiable net assets acquired. So we take the purchase price, subtract the value of everything we can actually see and touch. Right. And what's left over is goodwill. Precisely. And this goodwill is then recognized as an asset on the balance sheet. But isn't goodwill amortized over time like other assets? Nope. Goodwill isn't amortized. So it just sits there on the balance sheet forever. Well, not exactly. Goodwill isn't amortized, but it is tested for impairment at least once a year. Impairment. So we need to check if the value of the goodwill has gone down. Exactly. So if the acquired company isn't doing well or market conditions have changed, mm -hmm. we might have to take an impairment loss and reduce the value of the goodwill on the balance sheet. That's right. All right. So goodwill isn't a static asset. Its value can change. It can. And we need to keep an eye on it. Now, what happens when a company buys 
less than 100% of another company. Do we still consolidate the financials even if they don't own the whole thing? Yes, we still consolidate, but we also have to account for the part of the company that's owned by other shareholders. Right, that's called non-controlling interest. Exactly. So if a company buys 80% of another company, there's still that 20% owned by others. Yeah. How do we show that on the consolidated financial statements? Non-controlling interest is shown separately on the balance sheet as part of equity and on the income statement as a separate line item. So we're recognizing that the acquirer controls the other company, right? but doesn't own all of it. So some of the net assets and net income belong to those other shareholders. Precisely. But how do we determine the value of that non-controlling interest? A, a common approach is to use the fair value of the non-controlling interest at the time of the acquisition. So if we know what the whole company is worth, right. and the acquirer owns 80%, we can figure out what that remaining 20% is worth. Exactly. Got it. So we treat non-controlling interest similar to other assets and liabilities, valuing it at fair value when the acquisition happens. That's right. But does this affect the parent company's reported net income? It does. How so? When we consolidate the financials, we have to split the acquired company's net income between the parent company's shareholders and the non-controlling interest. Okay. So the parent company's income statement will only show their share of the earnings. Right. The rest goes to the non-controlling interest. Exactly. So we're not just adding the whole net income to the parent company's bottom line. We're splitting it up based on ownership. You got it. This seems pretty straightforward, but I'm sure there are some things we need to be careful about. Of course, there are always nuances. Like what? Especially when it comes to measuring goodwill and non-controlling interest. Okay. Different accounting standards allow for different approaches, and that can lead to differences in the consolidated financials. So those comparability issues pop up again. They do. Analysts need to be aware of these differences and how they might affect the numbers when comparing companies. That's right. We can't just assume that the numbers are directly comparable. Absolutely not. You have to understand the nuances of the accounting standards mm -hmm. and use your judgment to adjust for those differences when making comparisons. Mm -hmm. That's the mark of a good analyst. This has been a lot of information. We've covered so much from basic investments in financial assets to complex mergers and acquisitions. We have, but there's still more to explore. There is. Yeah. In part two, we'll dive into some more specialized areas. Like what? Things like those VIEs and SPEs, those special purpose entities. Get ready for some even trickier concepts. I'm ready for the challenge. So everyone, stay tuned for part two, where we'll continue unraveling the mysteries of intercorporate investment.